But ultimately, what the network operators are most afraid of is their consumers. And in particular, they're afraid of a new kind of consumer, a newly empowered consumer who has choices to make and the ability to make that decision, the ability to pull the plug and cut, cut the cable and switch instantly. And so many of the strategies that the incumbents are using are a measure of control, an effort to kind of control their customers. They're right to be concerned. Cable operators are not well loved in the United States. I don't know how your relationship is here in Canada with your cable companies, um, but where I come from, these are some of the most uh, un disliked companies uh, in the US. And consumers have been leaving in record numbers. They've had record numbers of unsubscribed. These numbers here are masked by the fact that uh, satellite television and the telco video services like Verizon Fios have actually gained some subscribers. Cable lost about 700,000 subscribers last quarter. So there's a real challenging time for the cable operators. These are real, these fears are grounded in some reality. Now, on the internet side of things, here is uh, perhaps the ugliest chart I'm going to show you today. Um, this chart is from Morgan Stanley. They seem to specialize in ugly charts uh, when they do their presentations. So let me try to decipher it for you a little bit. Uh, the, the information in red is really what you want to look at. On the left side, what you'll see is streaming video during prime time hours, during peak hours. Uh, you're seeing all the, all the data consumption on the broadband pipeline, but the red is the video providers. Netflix accounts for 21% of the bandwidth used during prime time hours, and YouTube accounts for 10% of the bandwidth used in broadband during prime time. On the right, you'll see mobile video. Uh, and on the right, what you can see is during a, a nine-month span from January 2010 to September 2010, consumption of video on mobile phones increased from 27% to 41% of the total bandwidth that was used in that time. Now, I started the mobile, mobile video business 10 years ago when I joined Packet Video. It's the very first company in the world to put video on phones. And I can tell you at the time, the notion was preposterous. I got thrown out of Peter Chernin's office because he said, video on a phone? I dropped the call 11 times coming in from Malibu. Get out of my office. They just couldn't take it seriously back then. So it seemed preposterous, but just in that short span of 10 years, it's now gone to becoming the leading, uh, the leading application in mobile video. Let's talk a little bit about Netflix. I know you have Netflix here, but I think the version in Canada, because of some of the rights issues, isn't quite the same thing that you get in the United States. This is an incredibly popular service in the United States, and it's popular because they really cater to their customers in a way that no other video service does. They started out as a company that would ship you DVDs by mail. And the premise was simple. People were sick of late fees. They were sick of paying a late fee. They were sick of paying rewind fees on videos uh, when they rented them from the shop. And so Netflix started a novel new service where you could keep the video as long as you wanted. It was a, subscri a subscription version of a DVD rental service. Uh, and that worked quite well. But the big change, the big threat, I think, to the TV business occurred when they switched over to streaming media. Now, when they did that, they actually did a brilliant job of migrating their customers. They had been using an online interface for people to tell their preferences, to talk about the kinds of movies they were interested in, to rank and review. They really created brilliant community features years and years ago. And this helped Netflix make recommendations that drove consumption. And so what we noticed that's interesting about Netflix is only 27% of what people order are the most recent motion pictures of the big blockbusters. They've really done a great job of mining that long tail and presenting that to people in new novel ways. And consumers seem to love this. Well, when they launched their video streaming service, they then added a few more features, uh, social features like this one, where you can share your ratings on, net, on Facebook and so on. And that drove awareness. That, that enabled the, the fans of Netflix to kind of communicate this and market it to their, to their best friends uh, on their social networks. And so this is quite a powerful move. And I think they've done a brilliant job. If, if you are a subscriber of Netflix, you know exactly what I mean, the dynamic menus, the dynamic recommendations, and so forth. This is a, a very novel service. Uh, and it's working. It's working very, very successfully. Compared to the premium TV channels offered on cable television, Netflix is actually gaining on all of them. They just recently uh, broached the 20 million subscriber mark, and so they've surpassed Showtime and Stars, and they're closing in on HBO. Now, you'll hear this, the CEO of HBO make all sorts of nasty comments about Netflix. His reason for doing this is because they're closing in on his business very, very quickly. They're becoming a rival. HBO had the opportunity to acquire Netflix 10 years ago. They should have done it then. Now, the two companies are equally valued. The exponential growth, this is a little bit old. This is from June of last year. You can see at that point they hit the 15 million mark. As I said, in the last six months they've surpassed 20 million subscribers. The reason I include this here, though, is because I want to show you the rapid adoption. In an 18-month period, 61% of their subscribers have taken up the streaming service. So they've really been able to migrate people from that old shipping out DVDs by U.S. Post and migrate them over to this new service of video delivered over Internet in a streaming form, instant viewing and consumers like it. 
those who watch it a lot, uh, those on the very far right, 47% of them have said that they would consider unsubscribing from cable. So this is an unambiguous threat to cable providers, Netflix, in its current form. Of course, they keep, they keep improving the service. And as you can see here, in terms of net ads, uh, net new subs, Netflix is crushing it. Cable is barely able to add any new subs where Netflix continues to add millions and millions of subscribers. So they really have defied every industry pundit's expectations in terms of their growth in the United States. Now, Netflix is not the only company that's innovating. Apple TV, a brilliant new form factor. If you haven't seen it, the thing's about the size of a hockey puck. And it streams video. So this is a, a service that's much more aligned with iTunes, and it plugs right into your television. What it does not do is stream video from the internet. That's the one thing Apple didn't do. And that they're very careful to manage their relationships with the Hollywood studios. And so they didn't want to threaten anybody or disrupt anybody. And so they've designed their service to be very um, industry friendly. Whereas Google TV is designed to optimize streaming video and of course their YouTube service from the web. And so there are many novel new, pro new, new approaches coming and different ways to get video into your television set uh, that, apart from the cable TV box where the cable operators are still providing these kinds of boxes that haven't really changed a great deal since they introduced uh, TiVo-like functionality, the DVR functionality, about 10 years ago. And so if you're a cable subscriber, you haven't really experienced a tremendous amount of innovation. And what you're seeing and hearing about are all these new novel services that occur outside of cable. Innovation seems to have shifted to uh, someplace outside of the cable system. Consumers increasingly expect to get whatever they wish to have whenever they want it. And so they live in a world where they're no longer subject to a programmer's scheduling uh, or uh, the idea that they have to watch channels in pattern. They can watch whatever they want. In fact, for those kids who grew up with the World Wide Web, think about it today, anyone who's 20 years old grew up with computers in the home. And their relationship to media is very different from the relationship of people my age, the people in this room. Their relationship to the web, well, they don't really even think of it as the World Wide Web. They think of it instead as whatever, whenever, and wherever. This is a customer that's fully in control of their media experience. And they feel that any screen they look at should be a screen that they can exert some control over. They should be able to touch it, move it, migrate their video from one device to another, or have any type of experience they wish to have on any type of screen. And so if they encounter a video screen or another screen that doesn't permit them to do that, they look at it as if it's broken, as if there's something wrong with it. Let's take a look back in history. How do we arrive at this place? So first you had pay TV, really originally a way to deliver video and broadcast signals to hilly places and remote regions where the broadcast signal didn't reach. But then quickly, by the 1970s, with the leadership of people like Jerry Levin and Ted Turner, it became a very lucrative new business and a way to create new kinds of national networks. And so it was a threat, really, to broadcast television, a thriving business. And by the 1990s, telecom companies were starting to eye that business and say, we'd like to get into it. So in response, the cable operators offered the triple play, a very successful way to fend off telco, uh, offering voice, pay TV, and data. But within that service were actually some, uh, some troubling new trends because as the internet migrated from a page-based metaphor towards more of a video-based metaphor, it's certainly the trajectory that's happening on the web in a broadband world, brand new services were introduced. This is where Netflix and all these other video services, downloading services like BitTorrent, YouTube, Hulu, and so forth, these were introduced on the web. Now this creates a problem for the cable company because it kind of diminishes the value proposition for pay TV, particularly because these new services offer video in ways that consumers actually want it, not in pattern, not in channels, uh, not in tiers, but on demand and in the format of their own choosing. So it actually frees the consumer. So it's very appealing, at least to a certain generation, the young generation. That presents a problem. Some companies, some of the incumbents, might con contemplate strategies like these. One thing they are considering doing is to restrict this type of new, vi new video service to a premium tier or impose some sort of uh, consumption cap. Uh, these are some of the strategies that have been contemplated. And these, I think, are quite, uh, uh, quite ill-informed. Uh, and there's another strategy, which is to simply choke off innovation by reducing the bandwidth that's allocated for these services. So this utilizes a, a way, to, you know, technologies uh, like deep packet inspection that allow the network operator to understand what the consumer is looking at and they can choke it off. We've seen network operators do this, for instance, with BitTorrent. Uh, they've actually choked off the bandwidth that's available for, serve, for people who are downloading torrents in order to make that service unappealing to people. And so they can kind of choke it off. And if you want to push this theory out even further, you can imagine a cable operator that's vertically integrated could then 
migrate their own video services there and offer those to consumers, thereby crowding out any type of innovator, in some respects, cutting off innovation um, by pushing their own, own operated uh, businesses. So this is sort of a, a strategy scenario that many have expressed concern about. Certainly in the United States, our Federal Communications Commission is looking very carefully at these uh, mergers and consolidation to make sure that uh, steps are taken uh, that ensure diversity of programming and access, fair access. But some have started to contemplate what this might look like. So here are a couple examples of what it might look like uh, in a way uh, where a cable operator might try to reinvent or recreate the cable business on the internet. Uh, so you might have a basic tier for $29.99 and then another tier, sort of you know, a, a richer tier for $39 uh, and then you know, at the, in the bottom of this example kind of a publisher tier if you're a blogger for $49. Um, uh, someone else provided this idea which is a, a telco package with a bunch of different uh, packages. Again, it's just a concept where for $30 a month you get basic ADSL and then on top of that you could add additional content bundles. So here they would try to like package up the internet into tiers uh, akin to what you might find if you were subscribing to cable or satellite television. And then of course if you go over your monthly usage allotment, well then just like a mobile phone company, they're willing to sell you additional minutes or additional data packages. This is going to drive people crazy and network operators who've tried to launch these services have encountered it. If you really want to anger your customers, this would be a fantastic way to do it. So these are strategies for control. Now, this is not a way to attract new subscribers. This information is not something that any network operator would want to get out there in the public eye. So instead, they've adopted a different strategy, um, marketing, or what I call lying to your customers. Uh, well, you know they're lying. When they talk to you about high-speed high speed internet, uh, what they really mean is, in Canada, your internet's six times slower than the internet that's provided in Japan. Same infrastructure. They're actually delivering last year's technology to you today. And by the way, I'm not trying to diss Canada here. You'll see the United States is just a little bit over to the right there. Our video, our, our broadband services are almost half as slow as uh, services here in Canada. When the network operator talks about unlimited data, what they really mean is up to a certain limit. This is a real message that's delivered by Rogers Cable today to their broadband subscribers when they approach their, uh, their 95 gigabit uh, limit in a monthly usage uh, cap. When the network operator says we pay attention to our customers what they really mean is we're using deep tacket inspection to investigate what you're doing. <laughs> and when they say, as Brian Roberts said, uh, Brian Roberts, the CEO of Comcast said, when they say our plan to totally reinvent television, what they really mean is our plan to copy Netflix. <laughs> when they say TV everywhere, what they really mean is a few shows on tablet computers. Now this habit of lying to your customer isn't unique to network operators who run a broadband service in the ground. You'll see this also with your mobile phone companies. When they talk about nationwide coverage, they show you a map like this and what they really mean is in selected areas. When they talk about a long-term relationship with their subscribers, what they really mean is an unbreakable contract with an early termination penalty. <laughs> And when they talk about 4G wireless, I don't know if you're getting this marketing here, but in my country, everything is 4G, 4G, 4G. What they really mean is LTE, which is about 20%. It's a little bit less than the ITU specification uh, for 4G. So it's about 20% of uh, the bandwidth that you get in a real true 4G implementation. So this is really a classic case of marketing hype pushed beyond the limits of reality. Nevertheless, these network operators are doing their level best to convince us that this is all in our interest as consumers. This is really for the good of the people because no one else really knows how to run a network and keep it operating and they're concerned about quality of service and preserving that service and keeping it operable and so forth. So they're doing their level best to convince us. And while I think consumers are smart enough to understand, and certainly empowered consumers are speaking up about this and starting to complain about it, there's another issue here. And this is really an issue for those who care about the future of the country, the future of innovation. And that's a question of whether there are really lying to their customers or are they lying to themselves? Are they really trying to persuade themselves that this is the, actually the service that they're providing? 